Good day. Welcome to episode 20 of the Aaron Wayne podcast. Going all over the place with this one, guys. Talk about NFTs again. Talk about what it's like to have my kids back full time in school and much, much more. So as you're ready, let's do it. What's up, guys? I spent like 20 minutes just farting around with all of the cameras and the watch ditches and all the things. I was like, oh, is my hair fine? Like, what am I doing? I just got to start these things, man. Just got to do it. I'm on a good schedule. Episode 20 is pretty crazy, man. I'm uh, I'm still cruising. Everything's still growing, too. It's interesting to see things that, you know, I posted months ago are still, people are still finding them and watching them, which is kind of cool. If you're, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I got like a new setup. I took the mat that I had on the floor and now I'm seated in like a bench kind of thing which is kind of weird took some time to get the camera to like actually work but yeah there's just something about this online thing where sometimes it feels a bit dude teaching yoga online you want to talk about feeling goofy that is a goofy experience sometimes because you can't see the people that you're teaching yoga to and so you're just sort of trying to create this energy (laughs) that's like not given back to you so that's a a pretty wild experience is just standing in front of a an iPad and sort of maybe seeing like little tiles of people on a zoom call as you teach them yoga. That's a, an interesting experience, which I'm not going to miss it. All this COVID stuff's over. Not going to miss the online yoga, man. Not going to miss it in the slightest, but um, yeah, you know, I was, uh, I was talking to a friend and uh, I was talking to him about coming on the podcast and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the focus of the podcast? And I just couldn't answer that question. And it had me ask myself the question, do I have a focus for my podcast? And if I do, what is it? And I don't think I want a focus for the podcast, but then I'm listening to this Prof G show. If you, you should probably stop listening to this podcast right now and find the Prof G show on whatever it is you're listening to, because this guy is spitting knowledge when it comes to finances, macroeconomics. He's a professor at NYU and he's just a super, he's funny, he's interesting. And he has a really clear perspective on uh, capitalism that I think needs to be heard because we get confused about what capitalism is because we don't really have capitalism in this country. We have like cronyism as he defines it, which is, you know, everybody talks about pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and, you know, working their tail off in the beginning, but then you get to the top and you get bailouts. And he says that those bailouts are not good for the long-term health of the economy in a capitalistic sense. And so uh, his podcast is super good, but it's very focused. That's the point I'm trying to make. And uh, I don't know if I want to focus podcast because the podcast is a tool for me to learn what it is that I'm thinking about, how my brain is working. And I also think I'm only 20 episodes in. And so if this is something I'm doing, I was looking at some analytics earlier and I've been posting on YouTube since September. Is that right? It might've been earlier than that. I don't know. September ish. So like, what is it? It's April now, almost April. So September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. So like eight months I've been posting semi-regularly on YouTube and on all the uh, broadcasting apps, the podcasting apps. And you know, now I'm on a weekly thing, so things are going to start building a bit faster. And maybe I find the focus as I go, you know. Um, I got a lot of traction with the how to run 100 miles post that I put up. Um, that was interesting to people. I think people are just um, want to run. They want to get back out and run. I've been getting back into running, man. The season's changing. It's uh, it's nice to be able to get outside and move. I'm looking outside my window right behind you guys in the camera if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, the trees are starting to bud. The birds are chirping. It's good times, man. Let me have a sip of coffee here. Yeah, you know, bring this energy up a bit. Mm. That is delicious cold coffee, man. My kids are back. I have we're at the end of the qu- third quarter of the school year, and we have one more quarter left, which is nine weeks in a school year. And the kids are back, baby. They are back. They're back in the room. I got about a third of my kids that are still learning online, but two thirds are in the classroom. And we got these dopey shields. I don't even know the science behind this. Like I'd love to, and I I didn't look it up, but just, I'm just skeptical of public health officials these days as, as I think we all should be, but then also we shouldn't be because we should all get vaccinated. I got vaccinated. So if that means anything to you, you should go out and get vaccinated if you have the opportunity to, but I don't know, like one day they're saying, 
I'm going to get pulled off YouTube and everything, but <laughs> one day, you know, they're saying in the beginning of the pandemic, don't wear masks. And then they wear, say, you know, wear two masks. And so it's just like, I'm slightly skeptical of all this stuff and whether it's actually, um, not the masks, but the plexiglass shield specifically is like, are they actually doing anything or is it just a form of theater to make people feel more comfortable? Because, you know, now that people are vaccinated, it's, at least in my community, there's a lot of people that have been vaccinated. So, um, is this just a thing to make us feel better because the vaccines didn't make us feel better? Um, I definitely think that the double mask thing actually does make sense, but it's super uncomfortable. If you haven't been in a situation where you're wearing a double mask, it is uncomfortable. It is not what you want to do for a long period of time, but the kids are back, man. They're fired up. They're, they're crushing it. Um, they're excited to be back. It's, uh, I didn't realize how many kids um, actually wanted to come back. I also didn't realize how many kids I don't want to come back. Uh, I was just in a meeting before I fired up the podcast with uh, a kid, uh, with um, parents of a kid, and they, they were talking about the kid doesn't really want to come back. Um, and it wasn't, it was a, I don't know, I'm not going to disclose anything about the meeting other than the fact that the kid didn't want to come back. You have no idea who I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, the kid didn't want to come back. And like, but if I were 14, you know, and I can pull out my cell phone in the middle of class or, and nobody yells at me, or if I don't have to ride the bus anymore and I can, during lunch, I can just play Xbox. Like, wouldn't you not want to go back to school if you're still passing and this kid was doing fine in classes and stuff. So yeah, I wouldn't want to come back either. So I don't blame the kids, but the kids that came back, like they're, they're fired up to be there. I can tell, um, they're engaged they're trying to figure out how to communicate with each other. So as an English teacher, I try to facilitate a lot of conversation in my classes, which is hard when you have two masks on, you're seated six feet apart, which they changed the CDC guidelines. Apparently you only have to be three feet apart, which is like another point is like, well, what does it actually mean? Like what is, why, what changed about the science? That's not the point of this conversation. That's another, that's for another podcast, but they, um, you know, they, they find it a bit challenging to start communicating, but they want to, and I can tell, I can like feel that they really want, and you know, spring is this time of like vibrancy and things coming back to life and the, the kids are ready for it, man. Um, and they're going to get nine weeks of full day classes and then they're going into the summer. So we'll see how that shakes out. Handful of kids are going to end up in summer school. It's the first year that my school district has offered summer school. And, um, you know, there's a lot of kids that actually need it because they're going to, you know, a lot of these kids that are learning online, they're sort of blowing it off. And, you know, you, you've probably heard the same thing. I'm not breaking news here, but a lot of these kids are just sort of, that, what would you do? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't, I'm not judging these kids they are teenagers. They need adult guidance, you know? And so a lot of these kids sort of blew off their responsibilities and now they're, their grades are suffering for it. So a handful of kids are going to have to do summer school, but a majority of the kids are going to be fine. And it's, uh, luckily it's a, a national thing. You know, I saw speaking of Scott Galloway, he showed me ugh, uncross sit, find my seat. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about this bench, but, uh, yeah. So I was watching uh, a YouTube video with, with Scott Galloway. Again, if you're still listening to this podcast, you should probably just end this podcast and go listen to him. Cause he's got way more interesting things to say. And he's got a really interesting delivery style, but he showed this chart because he's a macroeconomic uh, economist. He's like a super smart guy at NYU. And he showed this chart of how the gap between, um, high income families and low income families with, uh, the math scores and math and reading scores for those kids, the it's again like we we've seen a k-shaped recovery to the economy where people of means if you've been paying attention the stock market has exploded but there's millions of americans who can't pay their rent because they've lost their jobs in the service sector because of covid shutting things down and so you know you have am i gonna get like shadow ban are they gonna not from is youtube not gonna promote this video because i said the c word a couple of times i don't know who knows but you have this K-shaped recovery that's happening in the economic space where people of means have made more, you know, trillions of dollars of wealth has been transferred to the, the highest echelon of the billionaire class, while the same level of wealth has disappeared from the working and middle class people. And we're seeing the same thing when it comes to um, education. So the high income families, you know, they have a parent who can stay home, you know, the 
the uh, the mom stays home, which like honestly, like if you look at the numbers, it probably is mostly the moms, which is unfortunate because of the amount of space that um, has been gained when it comes to women in the workforce over even the last like five or ten years, and now those women, so many of those women are now at home with their kids. And that's what I see from my teacher's perspective. That's what I'm seeing. So I can anecdotally support that claim, but then also, I, you know, show me some numbers I'd like to see. Cause my hypothesis is that most women ended up, um, most houses that have a, a parent t- teaching their kid at home is probably the moms, unfortunately. Um, and I say, unfortunately, because you know, that's not equitable. That's not equitable for just the women to have to end up going home, but that's, Again, that's another podcast. The point being is either the kids and the families that have the money and the means for one parent to stay home, they're doing fine. You know, they were doing fine. The, they had an office where they could work like this, you know. And then I'll talk to other kids of um, assumed low econ- uh, economics and, you know, I'll do a Google Meet or a phone conference or something with them. And I can hear the TVs on. There's dogs barking. Uh, someone's yelling from the kitchen. There's just pots and pans banging, you know? So it's like, they don't have, those kids don't have a proper workspace and we're seeing the outcomes. We're seeing that the gap between the rich and the poor is widening and the gap between, um, the educational outcomes for their kids is also widening, which is disheartening and, and kind of worrisome. So yeah, I'm just doing my best out here, man. I'm trying to, trying to teach the kids, trying to give them the tools that they need, Especially since I only get to, I had the kids that showed up to my class last week. I had no idea who they were because they, like they had only been on Google meets the entire year and they just pop up in my class and I knew their name, but I had no, like their face. I had no idea who that was. And it's interesting. It's kind of like when you, um, it's kind of like when you hear a radio DJ or if like you've been listening to my podcast and you don't know who I am and you've never seen me and then you pull up the YouTube video and you're like, Oh, that's what he looks like. It was like that with some of my kids. I'm like, oh, I didn't think you, I, for some reason, having heard your voice and seeing your name, I just, it's just interesting to see like, oh, I, I didn't expect you to have like purple hair. I had one kid that just showed up that had like a purple stripe through their hair. And I'm like, all right, like that's your thing. Um, yeah. So I don't know, man, what else we got going on? I went to like this weekend, I went to a, I don't know if you've, I asked my kids about this. Have you ever been to a barrel fire? Like you've probably seen it in Batman. There's a scene in Batman. um, Which Batman is it? It's the one with the Joker with Heath Ledger as the Joker. Can we take a moment and pause for Heath Ledger as the Joker? Googly moogly. It was never about the money. And he just burns that big pile of money. Come on, man. Come on. The anti-hero is the hero. Oh, dude, I was thinking about this. I'll come back to that barrel fire thing. I was thinking about this idea the other day. I was listening to... Uh, Jordan Peterson and Eric Weinstein talk and they were talking about archetypes throughout history and talking about heroes and the idea that a hero is any individual who um, assesses the uh, how would you say how would you say this in an abbreviated way a hero is somebody who acts righteously within the structures that they have inherited that's fine that's a fine enough definition and so what I thought was really interesting is that we've seen so many so, you know, 20 years ago, the heroes of the stories were, um, you know, Avenger style heroes. But then you look at it and it's sort of I, I would love to do um, a media study on this. I think, you know, Heath Ledger's Joker and the, even the Batman character that, that Chris Nolan created. And um, who's that guy? Who's that guy who played Batman? You're not going to help me out, are you? It's not Ed Norton. Who's that guy? Christian Bale. The, uh, Christian Bale's Batman was very different than when it comes to the Batmans of past decades. You know, he was dark, he was disturbed, which I think is apt to that character. But um, I think what it shows is that our culture is sort of holding up these anti-heroes as their heroes. And what that means is that our, our there's a perversion to, uh, as to how we think heroes ought to act. And um, I don't know, maybe I could take a second to think of other examples but you know when you have the hero who's actually sort of the bad guy that shows that your culture is valuing that you know in like um what's this guy uh Joaquin Phoenix the guy who did Earthlings which is a terrifying movie that if you aren't vegan yet you should probably see Earthlings just YouTube it um you know I'll warn you that it's traumatizing uh it's about the food industrial complex animal agriculture industrial complex but Jacqueline Phoenix, when he did the Joker, 
you know, that was the realest of the real when it comes to an anti-hero. And there was a lot of uproar about people talking about, you know, this is somebody who shouldn't, the, the story of this, they use the term incel. They used uh, a lot of these terms that are sort of harshly placed against people who are isolated in our culture and sort of marginalized. And he acted in violence in that story. And what that tells me is, you know, and it was a great movie. It was a powerful performance. I loved it. But it was disturbing. It was really disturbing. And the fact that it was like put up as this, you know, he's sort of the hero. He's he he's the protagonist of the story, but he acts in a really terrible way. But it's also be undergirded by the fact that he has deep mental health issues that aren't being supported by his society. It's like all of that is indicative. And maybe that's what the art is supposed to do. It's all of that's indicative that, you know, we have a perversion of values that needs to be corrected. Um so there you go. How about that? I don't know. I like movies. I should be watching more movies. I said, yeah. So barrel fire. So back to the Batman. This is how I got on Batman. So there's a scene in Batman where he's chasing the Joker. Um, Christian Bale is chasing Heath Ledger, and he like takes the Bat car or whatever, and he rides it over, and he rides past a bunch of um, homeless people that are heating them, like standing outside of a barrel fire. So that's what I always think of. And that's what I'd known a barrel fire to be is just like a thing that, um, people that live in the street, they warm themselves with. But I went over to a friend's house and he like temperature gauged all of us, which was like a strange experience because he knew I was vaccinated, but I think he did it just because the other people hadn't been. And he like temperature gauged everybody. If we could do that in the schools, we'd be able to mitigate a lot. Like we're spending all of this money on these plexiglass shields and staggering all of our, our, um, you know, the way that the kids migrate through the halls and so forth. If we could just temperature gauge the kids, it would take a boop, 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 boop. It'd be so quick and so much cheaper than all of the infrastructure we're building in order to mitigate these strategies for a short term period. You know, we could even do that during the flu when the flu comes back in the winter, you know, we could still use temperature gauges. I don't think that's an irrational thing because the flu is, is also not nearly as deadly, but is also a deadly disease that needs to be mitigated. So that would be a, a better investment into our infrastructure. So my, my homie, he, he temperature gauges everybody. And then, you know, we hang out, we do our thing, we're chilling. And then, uh, night comes and we go down outside into his backyard and he's got this big steel barrel and I'm like, okay, man, we're like, what are we going to do here? And then he just starts taking all this newspaper, fills the bottom of the th- barrel with this newspaper, and then uh, puts some wood on top, covers it with vegetable oil, and then I think he just lit it with a couple matches. And the whole thing turned into an inferno. It was insane. Like, it was so hot. Like, I thought I burnt my eyebrows off. Um, I've started thousands of fires in my life. Um, probably thousands at the, at the, at the minimum hundreds of fires in my life. And I've never seen a fire go up that quickly without like gasoline. Um, and that's like a a crazy experience. Like gasoline is just like, be careful with gasoline. It will, it explodes. It doesn't work like lighter fluid, but this fire went off with the quickness, man. It was insane. Made me want to get a steel barrel. Um, but I'm not going to. Maybe I do. I don't know. I like my little humble fires. You know, you get the sticks, you get the pine straw. I used to work at a Christian summer camp, and I always called it pine needles, and they called it pine straw. This is like in the mountains of South Carolina and the Carolina Highlands, which apparently was a place. I always thought of Carolina as like Myrtle Beach, and like that's my idea of what the whole state was. Turns out not. I mean, they have a, a really thriving outdoor community and uh, did some rafting on the Chattooga River and uh, did some like very novice, novice, novice guiding on the Nantahala River, which is like a very controlled river. So like they let me do it, um, even though I don't really have a great deal of experience doing that. And uh, yeah, so they called it Pine Straw. That's the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed it. But I like my humble little fires, man. I like doing a little bit of a... A little, a little, you know, let it build. So there's, there's just like a, like a tension to it, you know? And then when it gets hot, you're like, oh, we earned this. We sat out here shivering for 20 minutes and now this bad boy is hot. So hot that you got to like turn around because your knees are burning. Yeah. I need to have a fire. I need COVID to be over so that I can start living my life again. I don't know if that's how you guys are feeling, but that is totally how I'm feeling. I am just ready 
for all this to be over, especially now that I'm vaccinated. I'm going to see my mom for Easter. I haven't seen my mom in a year. I mean, I've seen her maybe once, maybe once in a year. I think I saw her in October. Yeah, I saw her in October for like an hour and we were outside. But I think that's it. I think when's the... You know, we saw them for Christmas, and we all wore masks, which was super weird. So I've seen my mom twice in the last year, and so I'm excited to see her because she's been vaccinated. My pops has been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated. My wife has been vaccinated. My grandparents got their first dose, and they're in their 80s, man. And, like, they're, you know, when you get to your 80s, it moves quick, and especially with COVID. Like, COVID has accelerated the wealth gap. COVID has excelled, accelerated the... um the learning gaps between racial groups and income groups. COVID has accelerated the um, seeming coming decline of the educational industrial complex. And COVID has also accelerated um, the decline of our senior population. Because if they were, if you're, if the seniors were smart, they were, you know, staying at home, but maybe it turns out that that wasn't that smart. I don't know. Probably definitely was. Um, But you know, my grandparents are aging and I want to see them. And, uh, that's a sad story. I want to see them. And so they, they got their shots and, uh, hopefully I'll be able to see them in the springtime. I'll be in that area in about three weeks, but I don't think they're ready to see me yet. I talked to my grandpa on the phone. I don't think he's ready to see me yet. In other news, what else we got going on? You guys should go to a yoga studio. I'm teaching yoga. I got to leave here in about 15 minutes. So I'm going to wrap this pod in nine for a tight 30. going to be a tight 30 for y'all on the pod. But, um, yeah, so, uh, you guys should go to a yoga studio. Yoga studios are kicking back up, man. There are more people vaccinated. We know how to do it right. The spaces aren't packed. Like for example, my class right now has nine people signed up for it with one person on the waiting list. Uh, or maybe more than that. I think there's like five or six people on the waiting list, but that was, I was thinking of my 6am class this morning, but you know, the rooms aren't full because the state isn't letting classes be get to a certain extent. And you know, if you know my yoga studio, um, most of these, most of the people that listen to this don't live in my town. I live in Blacksburg, but, um, you know, my yoga studio in balance yoga studio, the studio that I teach at rather not my studio, it's a friend's, uh, a friend of mine owns it, but, um, you know, we're running the air out but in between classes, we're running air in the middle of classes. So like we're trying to keep good ventilation in there. People are distance and yoga stu- studios need you right now. Um, because they're, a f- you know, somebody, one of my, one of my teachers, um, she just had to close her studio. I just found out about that yesterday from the owner of my studio. Um, somebody who taught me the hot yoga lineage, um, she had to close her studio and there's a lot of businesses that are shuttering right now because, They don't have um, people coming in, you know, so uh, get out there and go do some yoga. Go to a yoga studio. You need it. You need to be around some people. You need to experience the yoga practice off of your computer. God, we're doing everything on our computer, man. I'm grateful for the fact that we can still do the practice, even though we're not in physical space together and that it's broadened our toolkit, but you got to get as soon as you feel ready to do it, get out there because the studios need you and you need the studios. And if we don't support the studios now, they're not going to be here when we need them. So get out and go practice some yoga. Do it. I got all fired up. I minted an NFT and two or three podcasts ago, I talked about non fungible tokens and I minted an NFT. I started on uh, mintable.app if the battery dies for you guys on YouTube, I'm just going to finish this podcast and then maybe I'll play like a random video over the audio when I post it, but we only got a couple more minutes here anyway. So maybe the battery stays on, but I minted it NFT, which was uh, extraordinarily easy. All I did was it was mintable.app and I took some nature photography that I've taken uh, from different places all over the country and it turned into an NFT and then I actually listed it to sell it. I don't know. Let's see. Maybe I can pull it up while I'm talking to you guys. But I minted this NFT, which just was kind of on a lark because, you know, I had a friend, a good friend of mine who listens to the podcast. Um, he spent $200 on a pack of cards on uh, M- uh, NBA Top Shot. And then he sold one of the cards that was in that pack. He bought it for, he bought the pack for $200. And then he sold one of those cards for 12 dollars 
1200 500 or 1250 which is just crazy i mean that's a crazy return on investment but i just don't see i don't see this stuff sustaining like there's so maybe nba top shot for a while but you know i'm on this website now and no my picture of the ponderosa uh ponderosa pine conservancy project outside bryson national park uh did not sell i listed it at five dollars and 16 cents I don't even know where that 16 cents came from. Maybe it was a fluctuation of the currency for Ethereum. But um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, there was an NFT that sold from um, Beeple that was like, it like sold for $70 million or something like that. It's like, dude, you, like there's no way that's going to hold its value. I haven't. And then you go to, uh, like, if you go to CryptoPunks, or just Google CryptoPunks, and you see these little, they look like Street Fighter figures. And I, I reckon, I haven't done enough research about it, but I reckon that they probably represent individuals in the crypto space that have been formative or programmers or entrepreneurs or coin makers or whatever. And, you know, these CryptoPunks, they're just little icons that look like Street Fighter characters from the 80s, and they're selling for thousands of dollars. And I just can't wrap my head around I understand why they are non-fungible. I know that I understand that they are they can't be replicated. I understand that they're on the blockchain. I understand that the creator of the art ends up getting royalties on it. I understand all of those pieces, but I just don't understand why you want it other than the fact that it's worth money. I can't wrap my head around it. Because like you pull it up and you can just pull it up in your your like your MetaMask wallet and it's like okay well there's this thing here's a little picture of whatever but like how is it creating value? The only reason it's creating value is because it's it's collectible. I don't know. I just got to do more thinking about it. So instead of buying NFTs, I've been playing around with minting NFTs with nature photography and I have failed. So <laughs> haven't sold anything. So I don't know. That seems like a safer bet than investing a couple, even a couple hundred dollars. Like it just seems like someone's going to get caught with the bag because it's really frothy right now. People think that it's the the NFTs is the next Bitcoin, which it sort of is, but that just means that, you know, I think, yeah, I don't know. I think Bitcoin right now is kind of exploding because all of these boomers are getting in saying like, finally I'll do it. Like, It went to $40,000. It's worth money. I get it. Like they start to understand the technology and you know, then they're buying a couple coins, which is driving the price up. And now the price was at like 54 yesterday. And then it was like 61 today and then dropped back down. So it's a highly volatile market. And I think it's because a lot of people are finally like they, they, they've, you know, they've taken the bait and not the bait that's like has a negative connotation they've they drank the kool-aid they're in they're getting i mean that's another negative connotation but they get it they understand why it's valuable but that's just driving the market up artificially because i don't know if those people are there for the long haul they're there for the quick buck and i think the thing with the nft market is that you know people think that they're going to catch it they think that they're catching bitcoin at five thousand dollars a coin or two thousand dollars a coin when in reality like it's a completely different structure because I can take my coins and I can sell them on Coinbase and it's through a distributed purchasing uh, pool versus if I have an NFT, I have to find one buyer to buy that NFT. Whereas if I have a, a Bitcoin, I can take it to Coinbase and just like, I want cash now. Give it, just like a bank, like give me cash now and they will. But if I have an NFT that I bought for $2,000 of a crypto punk, then that means that I have to sell it to somebody at least at, hopefully at 2000 or more. But that means that I need one buyer in order to do that. Who's willing to buy my one crypto punk for whatever reason. And that differs greatly from trading on cryptocurrency because cryptocurrency is a distributed pool of purchasers. So I don't know. We'll see how it shakes out. But um, I think maybe we wrap this. One last note I wrote down is I'm reading fiction again. I started reading some Toni Morrison. I didn't even know she had more books. I thought that I'd read all of her books, and I'm reading a book right now. I think it's called Love. I don't know. i got to look at the title. I'm bad about that, but it's pretty good. If you haven't read Toni Morrison's work, go into her, man. Beloved, Songs of Solomon, uh, Sula. Dude, read Sula, S-U-L-A. It will blow your mind. And with that, I'm going to leave you guys. Go read a book, you turkeys. All right. Peace.
that's it guys hope you enjoyed it make sure to subscribe rate and review on itunes or spotify wherever you're checking this out if you're watching me on youtube make sure you do the same hit me with an email at hello at aaronwayneyoga.com or follow along with my instagram at aaronwayneyoga we're growing man we're still moving we're still grooving we're still building so follow along as we build this podcast catch you guys on the next one peace